Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Invasive Plant ID and Control Methods with Valerie Curry. My name is Haley Howard and I am the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this webinar. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please only put those in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Valerie. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on Valerie. Valerie is the coordinator of the Scenic Rivers Invasive Species Partnership, SRISP, the first cooperative invasive species management area established in the state. The SRISP focuses on combining invasive species management efforts from public land managers and private landowners in the scenic river region of southern Missouri to make the biggest impact on reducing invasive plants in the area. Valerie has worked in the field of invasive species management and botany for four years throughout Southern Missouri, completing restoration work on a variety of habitats from glades, forested land and riparian areas. Valerie is also a member of the Missouri Invasive Plant Council administered by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. We are Grateful to have Valerie here today to share her knowledge and experience with us. And now we'll hand it over to you, Valerie. Awesome. Well, thanks, Haley. And hi, everybody. Um, hope you're having a great spring afternoon um, where I am in Southern Missouri. We're having a great sunny day here. Um, and let's get started. So like Haley said, um, my name is Valerie Curry and I'm the coordinator for the Scenic Rivers Invasive Species Partnership. Um, I'm also the coordinating invasive species biologist for Quail Forever. And uh, today we're gonna talk about invasive plant ID and treatment methods. And of course, answer any questions you guys have on invasives. So just a little bit about what I do. Um, uh, the Scenic Rivers Invasive Species Partnership, or the SRISP, as we call it, because it gets a little long to say, um, works together with lots of different managers, like Haley had mentioned. And on the left there, you can kind of see the counties that we work in. So we focus on the counties that cover the current uh, Jack's Fork and 11 Point Rivers in southern Missouri, which are designated scenic rivers. Um, and those are the only scenic rivers here found in Missouri. Um, if you've had the pleasure to float one of these rivers, you know how special a place this is. It's um, filled with lots of really unique habitats and um, ecologically important habitats. So that's why we're really focusing our invasive species work here. Um, and we provide a lot of coordination between the land, land agencies like the Department of Conservation, um, Mark Twain National Forest, uh, the Park Service, LED Foundation, um, with their invasive species efforts so we can get the most work done, but we also work with private landowners so we, we can work cross boundaries between public land and private land. So I get to do a lot of fun stuff. I do field work and outreach and uh, stuff like this where I get to talk to you guys today. So before we get too deep into the whole invasive plant conversation, um, I just wanna go over a couple of de uh, definitions. And that's only because when we talk about invasive plants, we hear a lot of terms thrown around like non-native, um, exotic, uh, aggressive, weeds. Um, so there's a couple of things that I always like to just go over. Um, Non-native, which we hear a lot with invasives, is just a plant that's been introduced to a new place where it wasn't previously found. But not all non-native plants are invasive. So for example, that picture there on the right is a picture of a forsythia bush, bush that a lot of people probably have in their yards as a landscaping bush. Technically, forsythia is uh, not native to Missouri. However, we don't really see it spreading out of 
containment or out of people's yards and showing up in places where it shouldn't be. So it's not invasive, it's just not native to Missouri. Now an invasive plant is both non-native and it's able to establish on many different growing sites and it grows very quickly and it's able to spread quickly and disrupt the other plants growing in that ecosystem. So it can, it, it's not native and it starts to take over. So things like spotted knapweed, uh, Cerecia lespedeza, multiflora rose, those can move in and in just a few years be the dominant plant species found in that system. The other term that we hear a lot is uh, a weed. And weeds are kind of tricky, but by definition, uh, a weed, it can be a native or non-native plant that's growing in a place that it's just not desired. So for example, uh, Queen Anne's lace. Queen Anne's lace is technically a native at this point. Um, and, um, you know, we see it on roadsides all the time. But if I see it starting to kind of encroach on a prairie or a glade, I'll try and keep it out of there because it's not really a desirable plant um, in that ecosystem. So I don't really want it growing there. Think also um, like any dandelions that you have um, growing in your yard. You don't really want them there, but it's technically fine. It's not gonna hurt anything. It's just growing somewhere where you don't want it. So you might think, well, why do we care about invasive plants in the first place? Um, invasive non-native plants um, take up valuable habitat and compete with not only native plants, but can also compete with crops. And due to how they can reproduce and spread so quickly, they um, outcompete native plants. So that means the native plants don't have room to set seed, grow and reproduce. Um, that void is filled in by an invasive plant. Um, this disrupts, I mean, everything. It could take the place of a host plant for a native butterfly. It could be um, not as nutritionally uh, dense for birds to feed on, or it couldn't. It could be a bush that's too dense to make a nest in for a bird. So it really disrupts a lot of different systems within um, ecosystems. They're introduced through many different pathways. Um, they can be brought in through hay um, for your cattle or horses, um, gravel. So sometimes whenever um, like we see county uh, workers do maintenance on gravel roads. You'll start to see on the roadsides uh, a lot of new invasives introduced because that's brought in, the seeds come in through the gravel. Um, if you tend to recreate in an area that does have invasives and um, we don't practice cleaning off our gear between moving different places, we could move plant material seeds from one place to another and disturbance. So. This could mean we have a forest that doesn't really have any invasives present, but once we go in and maybe do some um, thinning of some less desirable trees to make it a better ecosystem, we disturb that top layer of soil and in turn kind of kick up a seed bank of Cerecia that otherwise wouldn't have blossomed because there wasn't enough light um, going down to the soil in the first place. Um, and invasives end up costing a lot of money um, to manage through those fun facts there on the right. Um, the Department of Interior estimated it spent over $140 million um, to manage invasive species in fiscal year 2020. So that's about 35 cents per acre. <laughs> so when we talk about managing invasive species, um, you're going to see on all of the slides where I talk about how to get rid of invasive plants, you'll see IPM strategies. And IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. Um, if you've ever uh, taken a pesticide class or if you, you have a commercial or private applicator pesticide license, you might be familiar with this term. But basically, it's just a balanced tactical approach to pest control. So we use IPM, we'll use 
a wide array of control methods, um, not just one. And that's because it helps keep balance not only in the ecosystem, but almost kind of keeps those plants on their toes. Because if we use the same method over and over and over, it might actually adapt to take that type of stress and then that control method no longer works. Um, for example, we can build up um, tolerance to herbicides. Um, it also can help you save money. Um, for example, if you have a small population of something and you're able to hand pull it, which is free to you, versus buying a jug of herbicide, which is going to cost money, that'll help save money in the long run. Um, and it helps promote a healthy environment. Um, not saying that we need to avoid herbicides at all costs, but it's kind of one of those things where if we don't have to put chemical in the environment and it's there's a better way to control that species, we'll try that. So these are just some of the different methods that are in integrated pest management that we use. Um, cultural would be something that would reduce the establishment, reproduction, or dispersal of plants. So that would be something like planting natives. Um, you guys, we're gonna talk about one of the most notorious probably planted um, invasives, calorie or Bradford pear. Um, and we've, there's been a lot of great outreach in the past few years about how invasive that tree is and why we should plant native plants instead. So that would be a cultural method of integrative pest management to help reduce invasive species. Um, biological would be the use of natural enemies to help reduce a population. So for example, there is a weevil that um, damages spotted knapweed and does not seem to damage any other native plants. So there have been some areas that have used these weevils to um, help reduce the spotted knapweed population, which is pretty cool. Um, then you also have mechanical and physical treatments. So this could be something like hand pulling. This could be something putting down like a weed barrier or mulch, um, you know, mowing, anything where we're putting down a physical barrier or actively doing something to that plant. A lot of plants we can mow and hand pull to help get rid of or set back those plants. And then of course, the one that a lot of people are probably familiar with also is chemical. So chemical kind of we use as a last resort. We just don't want to automatically default to chemical all the time, especially when it's a small population or a population located in an ecosystem of high value like a natural area. So one last note on IPM, and this is really focusing on that chemical aspect. So like I said before, um, herbicides should be used you know, sparingly or in conjunction with other methods. And this is A, to help reduce the amount of chemical in the environment, but also it helps make sure that we don't create herbicide tolerant plants. Um, we're starting to see that some in the agriculture industry where we had Roundup Ready beans. We've sprayed those fields for so many years for the same weeds. And now those weeds are actually starting to become resistant to glyphosate, which is the active chemical in Roundup. So it's a good way to make sure that we're always constantly switching things up and using the best control method for your situation that you're in. Another thing to always remember when using herbicides um, is to follow the label. Um, again, if you've taken a, a, you know, a pesticide course or an herbicide course, you know this very well. The label is the law. Um, it has on there what rate you should apply the herbicide and how frequently you can apply it, as well as the maximum amount of chemical that can be used on a particular site during the growing season. That way we make, we're making sure we're not using too much chemical over a period of time. Herbicides are um, also come in different forms where they can be selective. So like I had mentioned earlier, Roundup is glyphosate, which is non-selective. So it's going to kill anything that it that is sprayed with it. So grasses, flowers, trees, anything. 
But then if we can use a more selective herbicide um, for what we're treating as an invasive, so we have a bad multifloral rose problem, we can select a chemical that will only target um, like a woody shrub. It only kills woody shrubs or it only kills uh, forbs. So it wouldn't harm um, the native grasses that might be in that field with the native uh, or with the multiflora rose. Um, so the more specific herbicide you can get for your situation, the better. You can minimize what, um, what you know, may get spray drift and accidental kill. So it's best to just go with a, a more specific. Um, and if you can, we always try and minimize the spray area if possible. So you can see in that photo, that's actually me spraying last year at County Road. And when I treat County Roads, I am spot spraying with that handgun unless um, it's like literally just a carpet of like Cerecia lespedeza, then I'll use the boom sprayer. But otherwise, we wanna make sure we're really just targeting the plants that we wanna treat. So if you have, um, if you're interested in getting a Missouri pesticide license, um, check out the Department of Ag's website there down at the bottom of the page. All right, so now that we've kind of gone over integrated pest management, why invasives are bad, we're gonna just go over a few species. These are probably most commonly found in Missouri throughout the whole state. Um, and of course, can't carry, cover every invasive today. So if you have more questions, you can always put them in the chat um, or check out some other resources that I'll mention here at the end of the presentation. So the first invasive that I tend to see a lot and especially in more residential areas is mimosa or silk tree. Um, this tree is sold very commonly as a landscaping plant. And you might uh, know it because of those really pretty like pom-pom pink flower blooms that it gets in the summer, like in that picture. Um, that's a lot of the reason this tree gets planted because it, I mean, I'll admit it's a beautiful tree uh, when it's blooming and the hummingbirds go to it like crazy. Um, however, this spreads really easily and rapidly. Um, for example, my neighbor has a very large mimosa across the road from me, and I am finding baby mimosas popping up everywhere in my garden, in our backyard, everywhere. Um, so it spreads very easily. Um, one way that um, a lot of people can treat it, especially if it's in your yard, is to cut it down. However, cutting it down alone isn't going to get rid of it. You have to treat those stems with herbicides. So just spraying them with um, a type of, you know, triclopyr or glyphosate um, to those cut stumps will ensure that it kills those roots and it doesn't sprout back. Now, if you have a lot of sprout, small sprouts, like me in my yard, you can actually hand pull them right out as long as you just get the whole root. So that's pretty handy. Uh, another one I see a lot um, in more urban areas or popular, um, you know, more populous areas is Tree of Heaven. And if you're familiar with this one, it's not heavenly at all. Um, this tree was really popular, oh gosh, probably back in the 60s and 70s. Um, it was planted because it grew really fast um, and it spread really well, uh, but that's also why it's invasive. Not only does it produce thousands and thousands of seeds, it also is able to produce um, clones from the, uh, from the roots. It's also uh, one of those tree species that if you cut the tree, not only will it reproduce at the roots, it can sometimes still reproduce from the cut tree. So the, the log will actually still put down roots and then trees will grow from that. This one, you can um, identify, um, some people think it looks like sumac when it's younger, like that top left picture, which I would agree from a distance. Um, one way to tell it apart from sumac um, there's two really good ways. The first way is um, if you look at the leaf 
um, it has um, two little teeth. So the leaf will come down, make your typical leaf shape, and then have two little teeth that pop off of the bottom. Um, so that's one way to tell that sumac will not have that. Um, the other way is this tree stinks. If you crush the leaves or tear a stem off and bring it up to your nose, um, it smells horrible. I think it smells kind of like a rotten, burned peanut butter smell. And sumac will definitely not smell like that. Unfortunately, this guy is really hard to kill. And really the only way to kill it is using um, herbicide. And we use a method called basal barking, which is where we mix a chemical with a carrier. Um, I like to use um, a commercial carrying oil. It's usually like a vegetable oil or something like that. People can use kerosene or diesel fuel, but I prefer, prefer to use the more kind of environmentally friendly vegetable oils. Um, and what you do is you apply a ring on the bark of the tree starting at the base of the tree to about 18 inches up all the way around. And because these trees are so thinly barked, that chemical actually absorbs through the bark and goes down to the roots and helps kill that tree. Cutting it's not really going to do anything. These guys are extremely hard to hand pull because their roots grow really fast. So. This one's kind of a hard one to get rid of. Um, next, we're going to talk about multiflora rose. Um, this one you'll see a lot in pastures, maybe cattle fields, um, roadsides, or um, if maybe you're biking and you know a city area along like a biking path or something like that, you might see it along like the forest edges. Um, this one is. Uh, one that I get a lot where there uh, a lot of people are like, oh, the birds and bees really like it, though. The bees frequent it a lot and the birds like the berries. And my response is, though, is if the bees are going to this invasive plant, then what's happening with the native plants? Are they getting that pollination that they need? It, how it disrupts that pollination cycle. Uh, and with the birds, normally invasive plants don't really produce fruits that are as nutritionally dense as native bushes do. So like this and with uh, bush honeysuckles, the birds may love the berries, but to them it's like eating sweet tarts. And you can't really live very well off of sweet tarts. They're great, but you're not gonna be very healthy. So this one flowers around the same time as our native rose. Um, and a good way to tell the difference between these guys without using flowers, because flowers only last, you know, a few days to maybe a week or two, is to look at their leaf. So if you look at the top two pictures, there's an arrow pointing to this bottom structure on the leaf called a stipule. And on the invasive rose, uh, which is the one on the left, the stipule is fringed. So you'll see um, the two horns at the top, and then lots of fringes on the stipule. If you look at the one on the right, which is our native rose, it'll have those two horns at the top, but then it's very smooth all the way down. So that's a very easy way to be able to tell the difference between the native and invasive rose. Um, this one you can control with mowing, but you have to mow frequently and you have to repeat it often. Um, prescribed burning is also a treatment method, um, but it's not an end-all be-all solution. Um, usually you do have to, um, usually you have to join prescribed burning or cuttings with an herbicide treatment, but the cuttings definitely help set it back and same with burning. All right, uh, next is autumn olive. Um, this one you'll see a lot again on roadsides, um, forest edges. Um, I'll even see it sometimes along the rivers here when I'm floating the jacks and current. Um, it grows in a very large shrub um, and it can go from woodlands to prairies to pastures. Um, it spreads pretty easily through birds. Because like I said, they, they produce really tasty fruits for the birds, but unfortunately not nutritionally great for birds. 
Um, this will also adversely affects the nitrogen cycle. Um, it disrupts that natural process in the soil. Um, the reason a lot of, we see um, autumn olive, um, especially older autumn olives is because at one point, they were a recommendation to plant for uh, land reclamation after mining or high soil disturbance because this plant actually fixes nitrogen. So we thought, hey, we'll build the soil back up and it'll help with soil erosion. But then later on, we saw how much it would spread and we were like, oh, probably better plants for that nitrogen building and there won't be as aggressive as autumn olive. Um, one way to really easily identify autumn olive is it has a very silvery underside on the leaf, as you can see in that bottom right picture, super silvery. Um, so some ways to treat this mainly is just herbicide. You can cut these, but if you don't treat the stumps, so paint the stumps or spray the stumps with herbicide immediately after cutting, they're just going to grow back from the roots. Um, the reason that you want to apply herbicide immediately after cutting a stump on any plant is within a couple hours that plant will actually almost form like a cap on that cut part and then it, the chemical won't be able to move down into the roots. So it is important to make sure you follow up any cutting treatments with herbicide. You can also basil bark this one during the dormant season. So a lot of our invasive shrubs and vines will stay green long into the fall after everything has dropped their leaves. So I don't know if you're, if you're kind of, you know, if you've noticed when you're driving along the highway, maybe in November, everything else's leaves have dropped, but then you still see some like green in the forest, like in the bushes, that's probably either bush honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle or autumn olive which makes it super easy to identify and treat. And it's not, you know, 100 degrees plus 85% humidity in November. So it's much easier to treat. <laughs> um, you can also foliar spray these, which means spraying the leaves, but I don't recommend that if the bush is larger than chest height on you. As a general rule, you really don't wanna be spraying herbicide up above your head. All right, <laughs> the notorious Calgary or Bradford pear. I told you guys that we'd talk about it. So this tree was first developed um, for cultivation in the 1950s. And when they first developed this tree, um, it was actually developed to be sterile or it basically couldn't be reproduced. Um, but when more and more started of them started being planted in yards, they were actually able to cross pollinate with other pears and hybridize. And then we got these hybridized calorie pears that are able to reproduce and spread pretty dang rapidly. Um, I'm sure you saw this spring on many in your states in Missouri, those white blooms like that picture on the right there. Um, they are one of the first things to bloom in the spring. Um, which A, makes them super easy to identify if you would like to get rid of them in the spring. Um, but they unfortunately don't smell so nice. Um, if you've ever been around one, they usually people say that they stink like icky rotten fish. Um, this tree um, is able to be spread by birds and um, by the roots. Uh, if you have one at home and it's in your front yard, next time you mow and it's, you've, you've let it go just a little bit too long after this thing has flowered and fruited, I actually want you to take a look at that bottom of the calorie pear and I bet you're going to find more babies than you thought there were whenever you go to mow around that tree. It's able to reproduce very quickly and take over open fields or woodlands. Um, they can form extremely dense thickets. So the way that they were cultivated is they grow in that classic teardrop shape and the branches are very close together. Um, so when they grow in a big thicket, it's really not useful habitat for birds. Birds can't fly through there and make nests very easily. 
deer and other mammals can't really navigate through those thickets. And sometimes when they hybridize, they can actually produce thorns on their um, branches. So, I mean, I'm not a deer, but if I were, I wouldn't want to probably walk through that. <laughs> They're also really not a great landscaping tree because as you can see from that bottom picture, because of their quick growing habits, they are actually extremely brittle. So um, after a high wind storm or even an ice storm, usually when I drive through a neighborhood, most of the trees that I'll see broken in half are calorie, pra calorie pairs. And they're also very short lived. They, I think on average, only have a lifespan of about 20 to 25 years. Um, so just plant a native tree, guys. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> um, so a couple of strategies to get rid of these guys. Um, you can hand pull them if they're small trees. Um, like really small trees. Now, if you have smaller trees, so not very big around, you can do a foliar spray. So if they're not taller than you, and then for larger trees, you can basil bark them. Like if they're on your property, um, like if you're they're in a fallow field that you're trying to, you know, get some natives in, basil bark those guys. Um, if they're in your yard you can cut it down and then you want to make sure that again you treat that stump otherwise you're going to have a bunch of trees coming up from the roots um, missouri invasive plant council just got done with their calorie pair uh, buyback program this spring if you haven't heard of it you definitely should look into it for next year all you have to do is send them in a picture of your cut down calorie pair. And then we had, I think, nine sites around the state this year. And you can go pick up a free native replacement tree. Uh, and these are all trees that will have similar qualities to the calorie pair, like flowers really early in the spring, or it has great fall foliage, or has really nice white blooms. And our last one that we are going to talk about today is bush honeysuckle. Um, this is one of those that I told you guys, it's the first one of the first things to get leaves in the spring and one of the last things to hang on to its leaves in the fall. So in that bottom picture, you'll see it, that most of those trees have their leaves almost off. But if you look down towards that bottom of the picture, all of that really dense green, that's all bush honeysuckle. So it forms really big thickets, uh, especially like on forest edges and in fields. Um, again, it has delicious red berries, but not really nutritionally dense for birds. Um, if you're wanting to, you know, provide food for birds, native shrubs are a much better option because that's actually going to provide the nutrition that those birds need to help you know sustain them through the winter for migration these guys um, are spread by birds because the berries are great but um, it can also spread by their roots so one important thing to remember for bush honeysuckle if you are going to remove it on your property and you're hand pulling it is you have to make sure you get that whole root. And they do make some awesome, um, excuse me, some awesome bush honeysuckle pullers that are like pry bars um, to help you get that whole root out if you're really needing some muscle there. If you have it on your property and you're doing some woodland management, some spring burns can help um, to help minimize that population and set it back. But you're gonna need to keep up that burn, um, that burn plan for a couple of years. And then for herbicides, you can do a cut step method like we talked about. Um, the only time I would not recommend doing a cut stump treatment on any of our invasive shrubs, so like autumn olive or bush honeysuckle, um, is in the spring. And that's because it's high sap flow. And high sap flow means we have a lot of um, that stored energy in the roots shooting up, going towards the top part of the plant to produce leaves. And when you apply chemical, you want that chemical to move down into the roots. So it's not gonna distribute your killing agent very well when you're applying it through a high sap flow. But so try avoid treating honey, honeysuckle in the spring, same with autumn olive, but the rest of the year, you're set to go. So 
I just wanted to highlight some resources if you guys wanted to learn more. Um, the Missouri Invasive Plant Council um, has lots of great resources from, you know, uh, distribution of invasive plants around the state, how to get rid of them, um, who can help you get rid of them if you don't have the means to do it yourself. Um, they have lots of different initiatives going on, so make sure to check out that on their website. Grow Native is a great resource. So if you are in the process of getting rid of invasives and you're you know, wondering, well, what bush can I put here? Uh, Grow Native has lots of great um, resource guides on you know, bushes that are great for hummingbirds or birds or mammals and other wildlife. And I use them all the time. I did actually follow one of their planting guides and did the mailbox planter and I love it. Um, MDC has their own um, invasive species page, so um, you can visit that and they have more invasive species listed than what I could cover today. Um, then there's also the Midwest Invasive Plant Network or MIPIN. They have great resources on invasive plants, how to identify them and how to get rid of them. EdMaps is a really cool website, so if you're the citizen science type person, and you want to help um, track where this stuff is popping up. And Maps is a website that's free and you can download their app and you can actually post and record where inv invasive species are found. Um, so kind of think of it as an iNaturalist, but for invasives, if you're familiar with iNaturalist. And of course, MDC has a lot of free pub publications that you can request from them. And if you're a landowner and you have um, lots of invasives um, in your woodlands, or maybe you're trying to restore a, a glade on your property or prairie, um, there's lots of different cost share initiatives um, that can help you pay for some of that invasive species removal through NRCS or the Missouri Department of Conservation. And if uh, you're interested in those, you can talk to your local NRCS office uh, you can contact a Quell Forever Farm Bill biologist if they're in your area, or you can contact the um, private land staff at MDC and they'll be able to give you some inf great information as well. And so with that, we uh, conclude today. I wanted to end on a pretty picture. So this is a, a glade located south of Ava, Missouri, on Glade Top Trail on the Mark Twain National Forest. And you can see some beautiful coneflower and larkspur blooming. And this is the result of a lot of my management and time going in and using burns and herbicide and hand pulling. And this is a result that you can kind of get. You just got to have patience and uh, you know the will to continue on. So with that, uh, I'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Valerie. We have a lot of questions, so right. I'm going to go ahead and get going on those. Um, let's see. So Barbara, we'll just open it up with Barbara. She was at the top of the list. Um, she said that you mentioned there is a $120 billion cost associated with removing invasive species or the cost of them being present. Um, she wanted to know if that is for management of invasives or plants and animals, and does that cost also include loss of income from crops? Do you know the specifics of those numbers? Not super, not super, super specific, um, but I can tell you um, whenever I do cost analysis for like my time for the SRISP and for Quail Forever, my time, we not only count, you know, herbicide or equipment that we need to treat um, invasive. So that could be the UTV maintenance, the sprayers, my truck maintenance. Um, but that also counts towards actually that time that you have to pay staff to actually go out and scout for invasives as well. And sometimes they do include the cost, you know, analysis of, well, we lost this much, you know, production because of invasive, so they'll put that in there. But I'm not exactly specific, sure on that specific number. Thank you. 
A question from Jack was that he had noticed you were not wearing a mask in one, in your spraying picture that you shared, and he wondered if that is um, something that's recommended. Right. So for that particular herbicide, the required uh, personal protective equipment or PPE is um, closed-toed shoes, long pants, long sleeves, eye protection, and hand protection. Um, I do not use any herbicides personally um, that require a face mask or a face shield when using them. Some do. That goes back to reading the label, making sure A, you know how to use it, and B, what protective equipment you need. But generally, for most herbicides, you need the closed-toed shoes, long pants, eye protection, and hand protection, so gloves. Great, thank you. And another question coming from Jaina. Um, she wondered if because of the expense involved in controlling invasive species, if there is any legislative action being considered that would prohibit the sale of these plants in our state. Yeah, so um, in other states, um, like Indiana, for example, they have um, had successful legislation passed to ban the sale of certain species like calorie pear. Um, currently in Missouri, there is no official legislation of that sort. We do have our noxious um, plant list or noxious weed list um, where there are certain species listed on that. So those can't be sold commercially. Um, however, the Missouri Invasive Plant Council is um, currently working on a project called the Cease the Sale Idea, where, um, where they are creating a list of invasive species that um, would be proposed for legislation to not be able to be sold commercially. Um, what's really awesome is right now they're actually accepting feedback on that plant list of what species to include and not include, and they're wanting feedback on that list. So if you go to the Missouri Invasive Plant Council's website, right on the home page, and the middle of the screen, it's going to say provide input for cease the sale. It'll take you to the link and you can provide information on those species. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely make sure to check that out. Perfect. Thank you. And, and yes, we will definitely uh, provide that link in our follow up email tomorrow for folks that are interested in being a part of that survey. The next question coming from Kathleen is, does Tordon work on Tree of Heaven? Tordon, I believe, works on Tree of Heaven. Um, a word of caution if you are going to use Tordon. Because of its formulation, um, it will tend to leach through the soil slightly easier than other triclopyrs. So I would not recommend using Tordon on Tree of Heaven if you have other desirable trees or shrubs within a radius of that. Um, but if it's Tree of Heaven, you probably have a whole grove of them. So, I mean, you're probably good there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Let's see. A question coming from Val is um, she has uh, a problem that involves one vase invasive plant, but one very aggressive native plant. Hmm. And um, she wondered if you had any recommendations for Vinca. Um, she's re repeatedly hand pulled it and it continues to come back as well as chrysanthemum or river oats mm. and she yeah. has removed those seeds from the river oats but never gets them all so. right yeah um i'm not super familiar with vinca so uh, my best advice would be definitely kind of look online um, there's usually lots of really great resources online um, river oats, uh, yeah, they, I agree. They can be, they're a great native. I love river oats personally. That's one of my favorite natives, but they can definitely get out of hand if you have them like in a rain garden or a water planting or something. They, they, if they're happy, they will spread. Um, and 
you're doing great by, if you're wanting to control the, those river oats from taking over, removing the seeds, um, if you see, think it's getting too out of hand and you're not a fan of you using herbicide, when, that, when those river oats start to come up and you can't hand pull them and get the whole root, another great method is like laying down um, like black tarp or cardboard. And if you, you know, deprive them of sun and resources for so long, it will end up killing that plant, um, especially if they're near water. Um, you don't want to use any herbicide that isn't approved for aquatic use near water. So that's a great non-chemical way to kind of help reduce that population. But yeah, for the Vinca, I'm not super familiar with it. So I would suggest kind of looking around online and seeing what the experts say on that. Perfect. Thank you. And Val had a, another uh, question that was unrelated to this one, but um, so are there results of the nutritional or there studies out there that, that people can read on the nutritional aspect of non-native versus native plants that you know of? Yeah, um, so one tool that I like to use when I'm looking for like scholarly ar uh, articles, which that's what she sounds like she's kind of looking for, um, is Google Scholar. Um, that gets you more of those scientific papers that you're kind of probably looking for than just a regular old Google search. And if you just type in Google Scholar, it'll take you right to it. Um, there have been multiple studies I know too, um, just cause I've gotten into, you know, I've been interested in this field lately um, between the nutrition um, difference between uh, native warm season grasses for grazing cattle versus like the cool season fescue grasses. And there's been a lot of really interesting research on that, like um, how uh, basic, I've read one paper where the, um, the warm season grass, even though it doesn't grow as dense as fescue, it provides like three times more like nutrition than, than that with like the same area equivalent of fescue or something like that. It was, it was really neat. But um, uh, I know Missouri Prairie Foundation has um, some interesting art, like scholarly resources. I'm sure Missouri Invasive Plant Council, if you go under their resources, they should have some scholarly articles. Uh, you should be able to find some cool stuff. Great, thanks for those ideas. Um, another question from Al is, uh, well, actually you had mentioned, he, he was referring to the Ed Maps. Um, oh, yeah. And you had mentioned that in your presentation as, um, it, it, would how would you see the value of that of using that resource um so i use it here in the swiss area um to help kind of prioritize uh, right now we have a grant from mdc that um, allows me to spray county road right-of-ways um, and then i also help um missouri department of conservation and the led foundation with some of their spraying and unfortunately, we just don't have a good record of what invasive plants are really out there until we're out there. Or like I have to go to one of the biologists and say, hey, I'm heading to Sunklands. What's the invasive species situation there? Is it pretty bad? Is it OK? Because if I can prioritize my spraying or prioritizing my treatments, I'm more effective. So I actually share all of that data with the land managers in the in our partnership. Um, so it's great to actually have those accurate inventories. Um, if you're a citizen scientist um, or possibly, you know, um, you're gonna use it on your own property. It's a great way to keep track of what's there. You can actually put, if you've treated something and then you can go back and revisit and um, you know actually record how much the population has changed. Um, and um, I'm always championing for agencies to use it. So, hey, maybe um, encourage your city to kind of, you know, start using it or at least use the information if they're going to start doing some invasive species work. Great idea. 
I do have another question from an anonymous attendee, and they would like to know if there's been a concerted effort to eliminate cow repair from highway areas by MoDOT or any other state agency that you're aware of. Yeah, so what's really awesome about um, this area of the state, so the Southeast District for MoDOT, is we have the first ever invasive species strike team for MoDOT um, in the state. And they have been working since 2020. And these guys, like their job primarily, is to go out and treat the right of ways here in the Southeast District. So they'll treat Highway 60, um, Highway 63, Highway 67. They try and hit the interstate sometimes. And then they're also hitting, you know, the lettered highways and some of the numbered highways. Um, the last couple of years, they've been trying to hit um, spotted knapweed and teasels really hard to kind of re reduce those down. Um, and then the goal is once we kind of get um, those weedy forbs taken care of, or at least uh, tampered down, they're wanting to start um, really focusing on the calorie pairs uh, situation. So, and what's awesome is because they have done so well and um, really, I mean, they've done great work. They've taught these um, MoDOT workers, you know, who really haven't ever had plant experience before. And now they're, their plant ID is awesome. Like they are great at spot, like they'll be spraying and I'm looking at something and I'm like, okay, go forward. And they're like, no, you missed a spotted napweed behind that like plant, that flower over there. Like they're very good. Um, <laughs> so, um, since they've done so well and the program's done so well, uh, MoDOT is interested in implementing more strike teams across the state. So hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll see uh, even more and more of these teams really start to uh, make a difference on the roadways here in Missouri. Sounds like good news. Yeah. <laughs> All right, another um, anonymous question uh, is if Cornus or USA is considered problematic with fruit eaten by birds. I don't know what that plan is based on its scientific name. So I'm not sure. I'm not super familiar with it either. So okay. I'll try to answer that one later. Yeah. <laughs> um, from Cheryl, she wanted it to know if you could briefly address the Himalayan blackberries. Yeah, I mean, as far as like invasiveness or just, I'm assuming because she put dot, 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 yikes. <laughs> yeah, they um they have started to become a bigger and bigger problem over the past couple of years. They are similar to our native blackberries. I will admit I am not the best at telling the difference between the Himalayan and our native blackberry yet. Um, that's been something I've been trying to work on. But luckily where I am, we don't have a lot of Himalayan blackberry. So um, I don't really get the opportunity to try and differentiate. But yeah, that's um, been a cultivar of blackberry that's escaped, escaped cultivation and now is really starting to come in in forests especially. Um, and with Himalayan blackberry, um, you can treat it very similarly to how you would treat multiflora rose. Um, those species would behave pretty similar um, in treatment methods. But yeah, it's um, it's and especially because it produces black, you know, blackberries, which birds are going to eat and other animals. Yeah, um, it's definitely something that I've been watching for here in our area. All right, thank you. Um. <clears throat> So Craig wanted to know if you can treat stumps with Tordon RTU. And, yes. Uh, okay. And what? And do you know the chemical name? Um. So that is a triclopyr and a two. It's a two four T two four D and I believe triclopyr mix. It might, actually might just be a two four D. I think it is actually. I haven't used Tordon in a couple of years. Um. But like I had cautioned earlier with Tordon because of its formulation, you do have to be careful when even with cut stumping, um, if you have desirable trees and shrubs next to the one that you are treating, um, it can affect those surrounding. Um, if you're wanting to do cut stump and um, wanting to kind of avoid that problem, 
I would stick with more just of a triclopyr formulation. Um, so uh, a Garlon, Garlon 3 or Garlon 4 would be a great alternative to that. Um, and you wouldn't have to worry about the uh, possibility of it spreading to um, undesired plants that you don't want it to kill. Great, thank you. Um, so John is asking if you have a recommendation for eliminating winter creeper um, that is thick and firmly entrenched over a one half acre of wooded shaded ground. Oh my gosh, dude, I, I feel you right <laughs> here because the house we moved into, I, I swear, I think they like planted it all in the backyard underneath the trees like as a ground cover and I I am bad I've been battling it now like it drives me nuts so I feel you I feel we are in that fight together my friend um, <laughs> um and it's a booger to get rid of it's it's hard um with that much of a thick um infestation which with what with which it sounds like what you have the first thing I would do since it's winter creeper is go in in the fall. Once everything else has gone to sleep, you have your leaf off, your native grasses and forbs are pretty much gone and go do a foliar treatment with a, a triclopyr. Um, that'll at least get some of it. Then, you know, when spring, summer comes around, we can see how much you killed. Then you can really start the nitty gritty picky work and you can either start foliar spraying it again or cutting it and spraying the cuts. Um, but I know they're tiny little vines, but if you're able, I just use like a weed whacker and then just take a hand sprayer and just spray over the area that I whacked with all those stems. And then that's just a good enough cut stump treatment. But that is a very persistent one. You're gonna be you're gonna be doing that battle for a couple of years. So stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, well, Jessica asked the same question about methods for removing winter creepers. So apparently this is an issue um, oh, yeah. that other folks are having as well. So, um, so hand pulling probably a large amount yes. is not going, uh, is going to be difficult, right? Or time yes. consuming. Uh, now in the, now in my, at my house where it was thick, yeah, I'm still spraying, but then I have some areas where I'm just getting some random sprigs and yeah, you can hand pull the, once you kind of get it tamed down, just hand pull. And if you do it after a good rain, it'll come right out. Okay. But then the, all the other alternative is, is spraying. Yes. Basically. All right. Let's see. So another question from the uh, Muhada is where can you, where did you purchase or where do you go about finding that honeysuckle um, polar pry bar that you mentioned? Oh, um, So if you look online and you should be able to Google like uh, honeysuckle puller, honeysuckle pry bar, it should bring up some results. Um, websites like forestry suppliers might have them or other um, like garden, kind of that kind of garden store, not like a Lowe's garden, but like a specialty store might have those. But if you Google like, um, like bush, like bush honeysuckle pry bar or puller, it should bring those up. Um, they're they're not too expensive from what I can remember. It's, they're under a hundred bucks for sure, but I haven't bought one in a while. But because you know, I could say they're this much, but I haven't bought one in four years, so who knows how much it is th these days? <laughs> well, we'll try to find locate a couple yeah. of uh, sources for for getting one of those in our follow up email as well. So let's see. Um, Terry is asking, um, 
So apparently previous owners of the property Terry lives at had a large wisteria on the property. Ooh. And the main vine has been removed, but they're fighting those pop-ups in the garden areas within a hundred feet of where the mother vine was. Um, along with a uh, pine tree encased in English ivy. So any tips and tricks on either one of those species? Well, good job on getting the mommy vine on the wisteria. That was step number one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> with the ones that keep popping up, unfortunately, that's kind of the nature of the beast with a lot of these is they're going to keep trying until you have literally exhausted their root stock or exhausted the seed bank. So if you guys just keep pulling up those baby wisteria like you have been and keeping on it, you're doing you're doing the best you can and it, it, you're doing everything right. Just know that this stuff is really, really aggressive and really, really good at being persistent. So <laughs> just keep up with what you're doing on that. Um, with the English ivy, I'm actually not super familiar with treating that because we just don't, I don't really find it in the areas that I'm treating because I'm in more, you know, a rural setting and natural area setting. And we just don't see English ivy because it's more um, of a planted horticulture species. Um, so my best advice for that would be to look online for some resources on English ivy treatment. All right, thank you. Um, so have you heard of rape weed? Haven't. Okay, well, Jessica's asking um, if okay, she wanted to know if it was native, uh, or she knows it's not native, but wanted to know if it's invasive. So uh, we'll just- I would say, I would say, this is, this is a general statement, don't quote me on it, but if I haven't heard of it, it's probably not invasive. But again, <laughs> maybe, maybe do some Googling. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's good advice. I like that. Um, let's see. Uh, Susan wanted to know what NRCS stands for. Um, so NRCS is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, so they uh, handle a lot of the federal cost share programs that are offered. So if you've ever heard of CRP, the Conservation Reserve Program, they handle that program. Um, they handle um, EQIP, which is another cost share program. Um, and they have a lot of different things that you can do in these programs from helping you get rid of invasives, um, planting pollinator um, plots, planting trees to help with soil erosion. The whole point of these programs are to basically take your land and make it as environmentally friendly or productive as possible. Um, so if you have questions about any of those programs, um, definitely go to your local um, USDA office and talk to one of the NRCS staff um, and, you know, kind of go in there with um, a goal of what you're wanting to do if you're wanting to plant stuff for pollinators or, you know, get rid of invasives and then they can kind of find out more information from you and um, what programs you may qualify for. And all a cost share program is, is um, basically if you do a practice um, through their program, it will pay for a portion of um, that cost that incurred to you for doing that practice. So it may help cover the cost of seed or cover some of the costs for herbicide that you use, um, fuel for if you do brush hogging. Um, so lots of different options. Definitely talk to the staff. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. How about this question of um, getting rid of Indian hemp? Is that a, a considered an invasive and uh, or it's uh, it's technically not an invasive. Um, believe so. So here's what's fun about being a botanist is that most of the time we refer to things with their scientific name because 
common names can vary very differently between people. Um, I believe another name for Indian hemp is uh, dogbane, if I'm correct. That's right. Yes. So um, dogbane is native um, and uh, it can be an aggressive native or a weedy native, meaning it can really take off if it's got a great growing year and kind of take over or show up in a place where it's not super desirable. Um, but that is a native species, but it's pretty easy to get rid of. You can pull it. Um, and I think a couple of species of caterpillars actually use it as a host plant. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. So is there a better time for treating or getting rid of the multiflora rose in the autumn olive or can that be done anytime? It can pretty much be done anytime. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, I wouldn't do autumn olive in um, early spring when we have that really high sap flow um, when it's you know trying to put on leaves because it's not gonna distribute your chemical the way you want to. Um, but Pretty much you can treat any time. My favorite time to treat that the woodier species, so like multiflora rose and autumn olive is kind of in late summer to fall um, because it's cooler out for one. <laughs> but two, um, a lot of our native plants, you know, will start losing their leaves or dying back. So we don't have to worry about, you know, spray runoff and things like that. And um, it's easier to target exactly what you're wanting to treat. Um, so that's just my favorite time, but you can pretty much do it almost any time. Great. Um, a question from Steve is, would you consider running bamboo invasive? I'm not sure if that common name is going to throw you. I haven't heard of running. Well, I, I can tell you that um, we only have one native species, and I wouldn't even really call it bamboo. Um, we have a native reed species in Missouri. Um, we find it a lot here in the scenic rivers region. Uh, any other type of bamboo species is technically um, non-native. And usually when I have seen not native bamboo, it's pretty invasive. It takes over pretty, pretty quickly. Um, bamboo is uh, one of those that spreads very, very rapidly. It grows really quickly and can spread really quickly. We actually had our neighbor that was, uh, when I used to work for the Forest Service, the neighbor across the fence had bamboo and we had asked if it was okay if we, if they wanted us to get rid of it because it was spreading onto our property and we didn't want it. And they were like, yes, it's popping up under our foundation. It popped holes in our pool. Like, please get rid of it. Like, <laughs> it was growing everywhere, like coming up everywhere in their yard. So um, bamboo is one of those ones that spreads really quickly. Um, but if you like the look of bamboo, we do have a native reed in Missouri that likes to have wet feet. So um, if you look on Missouri Department of Conservation's website, they have a field guide and you can type in um, reed species and um, it'll pop that up for you. All right. Thank you. Um, it looks like we have several questions yet. Um, so are you okay to go another five minutes? Sure. Okay, perfect. I knew this was going to be a, a question heavy session. So questions um, are good though. <laughs> so let's see. One, another question is from, um, uh, Jesse, uh, did you did you mention the you mentioned spotted knapweed, but but Jesse's asking about Japanese knotweed and if it's a Ooh. problem in Missouri. It is. That's a an invasive that can be found in Missouri, um, not statewide yet, as um, much as I know. But yes, that is an uh, invasive that can be found in Missouri. I have found it in a few spots here in the scenic rivers region but luckily it's not it's not super widespread yet and hopefully we can keep it that way um, it really likes to invade forests um, it's kind of similar to Japanese honeysuckle where it'll 
climb up trees and shrubs and kind of just block out any sun. It's almost like Kudzu's little cousin. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, luckily, like I, we, I haven't seen it too much in the Scenic Rivers region yet. We're also very fortunate because the Scenic Rivers region has so much great quality habitat. Um, it's harder for invasives to kind of get established, but yes, it is definitely present in Missouri. Okay, thank you. Um, have you had any sightings of grenade aphids in garlic mustard in Missouri? Ooh, that's a great question. I'm glad actually somebody brought that up. I have not yet in our area. Um, I have been doing that project on EdMaps. Um, there is a project on EdMaps where you can record if you see sightings of this aphid. And for folks who aren't familiar, uh, last year in Ohio, um, they noticed this aphid that was causing damage to garlic mustard, which is an invasive and it did not seem to be bothering any of the other native plants in the area. But we really don't know much about this aphid. It's a pretty new species. Um, so they have a project on EdMaps where you can record A, if you have seen the aphid on garlic mustard, and B, if it is causing damage. But also it's important to record if you're seeing garlic mustard with no aphids on it because we really don't know the distribution on this aphid yet. So no, I have not seen it here yet, but I have seen garlic mustard, so that kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, now, Lenny Haney wanted to know if if there's a way to differentiate between privet and native yonius. Like Wahoo? Oh, Euonymus. Euonymus. Yes. Um, there is. Um, so <laughs> there is a way. I'm not good at describing it. The uh, answer I'm going to give her is um, if you look up privet or your other native Euonymus species on um, Department of Conservation's website, like I said, they have that field guide. They usually at the bottom of the page, they have a, an information section on, on that species. And I'll say, this is how you tell the difference between this and this. And um, for a lot of the invasives, they'll say, oh, you can differentiate, differentiate it from native species because of these characteristics. So check out MDC's website. They have great descriptions and how to tell the difference between a lot of different common species on their um, field guide. Perfect, thank you. And um, let's see. Do you have a the best or a recommendation for a non-chemical or bird-friendly way to um, treat or get rid of free of heaven? Tracy's wondering. Uh, not really. If um, you're looking for bird friendly, um, definitely treat that more in the late fall, you know, when we have less birds here present in Missouri, you know, where they're migrating to warmer clients, climates. And also that basil bark method that's only applying chemical to the outside trunk of the tree right at the base. So it's not really going to affect those birds. The bird, uh, that tree doesn't produce um, a fruit as a seed. The seeds are wind dispersed. So birds don't really eat them. Um, so that would probably be my best advice. Great, thank you. Uh, spotted knotweed and thistle blossoms look familiar. Um, are they similar in, in terms of the species themselves? Yes, they are in the same family. Um, spotted knapweed and thistles are in the same family. That's why they look the same. Good catch. Um, spotted knapweed does not have uh, your common, you know, spikes or thorns that thistles will have. Um, and it grows more kind of as a shrubby, you know, herbaceous plant where thistles, you know, have those really thick leaves. Um, fun fact, if you didn't know, there are native thistles in Missouri. So not all thistles are bad thistles. Um, one easy way to tell a native thistle from an invasive thistle is if you 
turn the leaf over to look at the underside of the leaf. If the underside of the leaf is white or whitish, it'll have like, you know, it's pretty distinctly white. That's a native thistle. If you turn the leaf over and it's pretty much the same color as the top of the leaf, it's green, that's an invasive thistle. And native thistles um, provide great um, habitat for finches. Finches love to make their nests in them and they love to eat the seeds. Um, there are several species of butterflies that use thistles as host plants. So definitely keep the good thistles if you've got them. All right, thank you. And let's see. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, this will be our last question, and then sure. um, I'll kind of go through the other ones. And if there's other ones that I feel um, you haven't answered, then I might shoot those to you for for the follow up um, email. But sure, uh, I think this is an interesting question. Um, so Cecilia says that. Uh, she has a lot of calorie pear trees around the base of two pecan trees, Ooh. and she she really wants to keep the pecan trees safe from the poison, um, but kill the you know invasive calorie pear. Do you have any advice there? Yeah, um, uh, definitely. I would um, make sure that you're using like the cut stump method. So you're only applying herbicide on those stumps of the calorie pair and um, use a good quality triclopyr um, that not like a 2,4-D uh, solution of chemicals. So a triclopyr targets for certain forbs and woody species. And an example, um, like a, a chemical name for that would be Garlon 4. Um, we use Garlon I've used Garlon for personally when treating uh, things and it has not caused damage to adjacent trees or shrubs. It's only caused damage to the trees that I've applied chemical to. So my best advice would be make sure you're doing a very targeted treatment method like cut stump where you're only applying the chemical to that tree and make sure you're using a triclope here. All right, great. Well, you've provided us with a wealth of information today to think about and research more on. So um, we would thank you very much for your time and your expertise on invasives and for your work that you're doing to help eradicate these um, from the landscapes in our great state. So thank you. And uh, we, uh, Again, we'll be sending up that follow-up email uh, for those um, who maybe didn't get to uh, make it to this session or want to revisit any part of what was discussed today uh, during the webinar. Uh, just for a closing bit of information, um, we will be um, hosting another webinar on May 24th. It's called Take a Virtual Hike on the Prairie. So if you wanna see some awesome native plants, um, Bruce Schutte will be uh, leading that hike. And also, just so you know, uh, today is Give St. Louis Day and we have um, had Wonderful response from that. Uh, thanks to donations from 30 people so far, we have um, reached $2,676.50 of our goal to raise $5,000 to be matched 100% during today's Give St. Louis Day fundraiser. So uh, as you know, or hopefully you know, if you've been on any of our webinars, prairies are under threat from land conversion as well as, as invasive plants. Uh, but MPF is working assertively to protect prairie. We own and manage 32 sites, totaling 4,400 acres. And with partners, um, we help to protect thousands of additional prairie acres. So if you can, um, please help us continue our award-winning prairie conservation work by making a donation of $10 or more today through Give St. Louis. And that uh, link should be in the chat. So once again, thank you so much, Valerie. It's great to hear from you. And hopefully we'll see you back here sometime soon. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you.